Hello and welcome back to our IGS and PHP conference 2020. My name is Jan Bernecke from the editorial team and the upcoming session will be about the topic backward compatibility versus technical debt. For this I would like to introduce your speaker Alan Schlesser. It's very nice to have you with us. Um, if you're having any questions during the talk, please use the chat function or the Q&A panel to reach out to us. Alan will be very happy to answer your questions uh, after his session. And also please do so if you are facing any technical difficulties so we can help you out in the fastest way. And uh, saying this, I hand over to you, Alan, and enjoy the session. Thank you, Jan. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I will talk about um, two very opposing forces. And so it's quite, quite a poetic title. Um, but it turns out that in most of the decision making in software engineering, um, these two opposing forces all, always need to be taken into account. That's why they're so important. And I will start by going over their theoretical meaning. And later on, I will talk more about what this means for the WordPress project, um, more specifically, which is a PHP project that has been around for a long time and is known to uh, have a lot of uh, issues with both backward compatibility and technical. Um, so let me share my screen. There we go. So um, first of all, what is technical debt? Um, technical debt was coined by Ward Cunningham. It is basically a term that um, that is used to approximate the effect, this specific effect in software engineering to something you're more familiar with from the financial world. Uh, so technical debt means that um, you, you borrow something from the future to, to have something right now. And while you're still borrowing it, you will have to pay interest. And as long as you don't repay the principal, of that debt, uh, you will continue incurring the interest cost. Uh, the reason that this uh, analogy is used uh, here is because in software engineering, when you cut corners, it means you can move faster, you can make more progress uh, in a shorter amount of time, which ends up uh, being, might cost you less, it might make you faster to the market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so basically, you're um, borrowing something from the future um, to move ahead faster in the present, but this technical debt is something you drag along and that will incur a cost every time you make changes to the project until you have resolved that debt. Uh, so the interest is the, uh, the critical part. When you... Um, Let's say you, you take a shortcut in your code, you use a hack to get something working instead of the properly designed, properly architected solution. Um, the hack is pro probably very fast to implement. It gets you to the solution immediately, but it will be very inflexible in the future to make changes as your requirements change. Um, so as long as you have this hack in place, whenever you need to make changes to this specific area of the code, it will be more difficult to make these changes. So this additional difficulty is basically the interest uh, that you pay on this uh, technical debt. And um, the further you go along, where you don't keep this technical debt in check, uh, the more this interest will grow, will accumulate. So it will become more and more difficult to make changes to your code, it will be more costly in both in time and in money uh, to make changes. And considering that all the software projects should always be considered in, in flux in some form because the requirements are constantly changing. There's, there's no uh, definite done in a software project uh, unless the, the, the project is deprecated and archived. So as long as the project is in use, it is usually not done, it is just um, at a given state where it has solved a lot of existing requirements, but hasn't solved some of the 
new or upcoming requirements. So anytime there's a requirements change, you need to make changes to your software. And when you have a lot of technical debt, you incur a lot of interest cost on these changes. So it becomes more and more costly to just keep the project uh, up to par with the requirements that are constantly changing. So you need to um, you need to make sure that this doesn't grow out of hand where all of a sudden um, you notice a bug in your project, you need to fix that bug, but it costs you two months of development time just to get that bug fixed because of the way everything works together. So you don't want that to happen. You want to stay flexible so that you can, you can always uh, be fast to react to new requirements changes. And there's four types of technical debt. Uh, I've drawn them here on a, on a quadrant, on quadrants. There's um, the uh, reckless side of things and the prudent side of things. I'm probably pointing in the wrong way here. Um, and then there's the deliberate way of, um, of creating the technical debt. And there's the inadvertent way of uh, creating that technical debt. So if we start at the reckless side, um, everything that's on the reckless side um, should never happen, theoretically. So basically what this means is that this could be avoided. Um, the deliberate reckless uh, technical debt is when you know that something is bad, but you do it nevertheless because um, you just don't care. Um, so that's... That's basically every time that that should be avoided, um, because if you're aware of what technical debt means in the long term for your productivity, it should be a given that it's not necessarily a good idea to just incur it uh, arbitrarily throughout the project. So that quadrant, the reckless deliberate one, that should always be avoided. And then you have the reckless inadvertent one, that is... Um, when you create technical debt because of ignorance, uh, out of ignorance. So you just don't know it any better. You create something and you think it's all good, um, but it's not, it's not adhering to any best practices uh, at the time. It's not adhering to any proper architecture, but it's just that uh, you don't know how to do it properly. So um, both of these, the reckless, deliberate, and the reckless inadvertent technical debt, they should be avoided. And um, then on the prudent side, uh, you have prudent, deliberate uh, technical debt. That is the, um, the basic use case that you also should use with, with strategic loans, with strategic financial debt, where um, the debt is, the, the um, doing it correctly would have more of a negative impact than doing it not correctly, but getting to move faster. So that might be a strategic decision. So if you create a new, um, let's say you create a new uh, software as a service offering, you have a great idea, you know that uh, there's market fit, then it might make sense to get the first version out as fast as possible. So don't care too much about architecture, get it as far out as fast as possible to be the first to market, because being first to market is a huge strategic advantage. In that case, it makes sense to incur technical debt, but you need to keep in mind that this was a strategic trade-off and you will have to repay that technical debt later on. So um, the technical debt has to be included in all of the calculations and the planning. And then you have the prudent inadvertent technical debt that happens when um, when you indeed um, know how it should be done and uh, you, uh, you know most of the best practices, but oftentimes it's just uh, while you're building uh, a product, while you're building your software, it just happens that after the fact you've already grown again, you know more about the business domain, you know more about the specific problems you're facing. And so you actually have a better idea of how to do it properly after you've done it. Um, that is something that is hard to avoid in software engineering, unfortunately. So um, 
most projects also uh, have technical debt that could theoretically have been avoided, uh, but it's just uh, that um, yeah, the business domain was not clear enough or something like that. And so um, even though you were prudent, you did pay attention to proper architecture, you end up with some technical debt that can be refactored later because then you, you know it better. Um, all of this leads us to um, the realization that um, you can control the technical debt you want to include in the project in some way. And so there's decision-making involved. You can actually decide how much you want to incur, how much you want to make strategic technical debt to move faster. But there's, um, when, uh, when you consider what that has as an impact on the long-term productivity of the project, there's uh, a bit of a, a, a payoff line that you can see here that, that I try to visualize in this diagram. Uh, so on the horizontal axis, you see the time of the project. And um, on the vertical axis, you can see um, uh, this basically means how quickly you can add functionality to, to your project. And uh, with a good design, you can see that it's much slower to start off. So it will take you longer time to actually make progress in the beginning when you always want to properly plan your architecture and build it out properly. But over time, you actually start to accelerate the way you can add functionality to your software. And whereas when you don't have proper design, when you just hack at it, uh, it makes you start out faster but um, this quickly, um, there's, a, um, there's a curve that actually decelerates in that case. And after a while, there's no benefit to be had to have started out faster because uh, it gets so, um, so effort, uh, the, the effort keeps growing to add functionality to your project so that you become slower and slower over time. The productivity uh, greatly decreases. So there's this design payoff line, it's called, it's, uh, that was coined by Martin Fowler, where uh, when you include proper software design from the start, um, if the project uh, lives for longer than this design payoff line, then it makes sense to start correctly and properly with uh, good software architecture from the start. So the time is an important component here. You should always be aware of what the time frame of your software project is. Are you building a framework that you want to nurture during the next 20 years? Then absolutely start out the correct way. Are you building uh, um, an interactive landing page for a, a TV campaign that starts in one week and ends the next week? Um, then there's probably no reason whatsoever to to take care of proper design just get it done the quickest way possible because the lifetime of the project will never reach that design payoff line um, so um, there's another way to say that the technical depth um, the way you you consider it this is all part of the requirements of the project and when you evaluate the requirements you need to be aware of what the expected lifetime of the project is. And that also lets you make uh, informed decisions about um, how to deal with technical debt, whether it's okay to, to do um, prudent, uh, um, prudent planned technical debt, or whether you should try to avoid it at all costs. Um, so, then we have the other term, this other, the opposing force to technical debt, which is backward compatibility. Uh, so backward compatibility is the interoperability in time. So whether a new piece of code can interoperate without fault with an old piece of code in some way. It might be with its, with its own parts of the code, it might be with a third party library, depends on what the software actually represents. If you build a framework, for example, the framework will have a certain API, a certain uh, interface that you want to define. And the backward compatibility means um, for how long certain parts of the interface stay compatible with older parts 
so that when someone uses this library, they can actually use multiple versions without needing to always change their own consuming code while they go from one version to the other. So that's the, that's the general uh, concept of backward compatibility. And when back, uh, backward compatibility is not given, when you fail to stay backward compatible, then um, that's what you call a breaking change. So you make a change to the interface of your framework, for example, that changes the arguments that you use for calling a certain method, and all of a sudden, someone you use the old way of doing things will not be able to do that with the new version of the library. It will just break. So they need to adapt the consuming code and need to take this breaking change into account in some form. It could mean that they just adapt their code one way uh, once while they update the library. It could also mean that they want to support both versions of the library. And then they will have to have two different ways of consuming your library which creates technical debt on their side. So backward compatibility um, is very important for the consumers of your code because the less backward compatible uh, your code is, the more problematic it is to use for someone else. And you don't want to build something where everyone that uses it needs to stay completely in sync on the hour while you are making changes. Um, so backward compatibility, uh, it's important to note that it is about the interface. Um, what does that mean? So when you, build, um, when you build a bit of more complex code, you will have parts of the code that are face facing outwards toward the code that consumes them. And you have code that is internal, like your private methods that... Um, that just has logic that will never be surfaced to third-party code. And to backwards compatibility, it's only important to keep it for the interface. Because when, uh, when you make a change to some of the private methods, um, no one should actually be integrated with your code at that level that they would notice that change. That's why you have interfaces, that's why you have abstractions and, and layers to uh, safeguard against uh, modifications so that, um, that you can have contracts and guarantees in place. So the interface is basically um, you create a contract that where you say, okay, as long as you as a consuming part of the code adhere to this interface, I guarantee that I will also adhere to the other side of the interface so that we can communicate without uh, problems. Um, so if you change something that's not part of the interface, then that would not be backward compatible uh, uh, cha uh, breaking change uh, because the other part of the software was never meant to use that part. Uh, this creates um, kind of black boxes where um, if, if you actually have very strict, very limited interfaces in place, you can do a lot of changes behind the scenes without anyone ever noticing of the, of the consuming code. Um, so that makes it much easier to develop against um, because, um, yeah, if you don't have a fixed interface, if the interface itself is constantly changing, it will be a moving target. It will basically be, you start off reading documentation, how am I supposed to use this? So you're using it like this. And while you're testing it, there's a new update coming out where the interface changed. So already while you're developing against it, it already changes and it breaks. So you need to go back and change your code, change your tests, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you already published a version of your code, that becomes even worse because um, all of a sudden you published code that was supposed to work but it breaks because someone else made a change. And depending on what your users see, they will blame you for, um, for having your code break. They are not aware of who had which contracts in place, uh, interfaces in place. So they will bl just blame the one that's throwing the error usually. And chances are high that it will be you because you're trying to use something that's not the way it's supposed to be anymore. So you're calling a method in the wrong way, for example. So your code will break and your users will blame you, but it was actually the interface that changed. 
that didn't adhere to the contract. So having that sort of moving target is very pro problematic. If code is known to have a very robust interfaces in place, that actually increases trust in that code. Trust is important because um, there are not many guarantees you can have for the long-term roadmap of any project. So if you want to use a library, you won't get a contract with the library creator that guarantees that library will stay as is for the next 10 years. That usually doesn't happen. Um, so the only thing you have instead of guarantees is trust. You can or cannot trust that the library will stay mature and working for the expected lifetime of your project. And that trust is the only thing you can rely on. And the trust is hard to earn and easy to lose. So if you create something that is meant to be used as library by other developers, if you constantly break your contracts, if you're constantly changing your interface, then the other developers will quickly lose the trust in that and they will just stop using it. Um, that's, um, as, as, soon as, as soon as a project has that reputation of easily breaking, of being brittle, of changing all the time, uh, people will be very, um, um, very wary about um, trusting their project lifetime to, to that library of framework. And also for the end users, it's, it's also good because all of these breaking changes usually result in bugs and bugs, they end up with the end users. And uh, if you only rely on uh, mature libraries that stay backward compatible, um, it makes it easier to not have bugs in your part of the code as well. So in general, you will have a more polished product. So backwards compatibility, while it is a bit of a hassle to, um, to ensure, it's a very important part of any code that is supposed to, um, to live for a medium to long-term requirements. Um, so why is not everything completely backward compatible? If backward compatibility, backward compatibility is so important, and if it's so bad to have breaking changes, why don't we build everything just to stay compatible? Um, that's where we start getting into that uh, opposition between these two forces and, and the bit of paradox that, that makes this such a hard problem to solve. But first of all, backward compatibility hinders um, innovation. If you cannot easily change important parts of your code, if you're just stuck uh, fixing bugs and making minor changes, but cannot really drastically make a disruptive change that you think is needed, then that hinders innovation. You cannot quickly get a new version out with major improvements uh, because that would be breaking changes. So you start iterating and iterating and iterating in the hopes that at some point you will be able to fix it smoothly, but uh, most of the time that doesn't happen. Um, so that, that's really a problem if the code is not about something that was around for the last 20 years and is supposed to be around for the next 20 years in the same way, but rather where it's code where you want to create a competitive product that uh, tackles a new market or something like that it needs to be able to make disruptive change. And that means it cannot be backward compatible. And also backward compatibility is hard. There are so many moving parts um, that come together to uh, make your job miserable when you try to keep your code just working. Um, there's um, platform changes, there's language changes, there's tooling changes. There's requirements changes and so on and so forth. So all of these come together and make it so that you are constantly being challenged to adapt your code to this changing environment. And um, whenever you make changes, uh, you need to um, be aware of what all the other iterations of the code uh, were doing. Um, so it might, for example, be that you're iterating over code in multiple versions, but then 10 patch versions down the line, you do a change that seems to be compatible with that, with the version immediately 
prior, but all of a sudden is incompatible with the first version in the sequence of iterations. Because um, at one point, uh, there was just some nuance that, that was lost to the refactorings. So it's actually pretty hard to stay completely backward compatible and also make changes. It would be easy if everything would be static, but it's not. Uh, your code cannot be static because the environment in which it lives is not static. So you need to make changes and making changes uh, is problematic um, when it comes to backward compatibility. And then um, backward compatibility um, is, um, yeah, it does not only hinder innovation, it also makes it so that you cannot make use of new developments um, in your environment. For example, uh, there's PHP 8 coming out now. It might have some nice features, uh, features, but if your code needs to stay compatible with PHP 7.2 or, or whatnot, then you cannot actually use these new features because it would lock you out of all the other versions that were before. Uh, so um, it, this also makes it so that your code can only ever rely on the least common denominator of your environment. For example, if you stay compatible with a certain range of PHP versions, you need to code against the lowest version that is in that range. You cannot use anything of the higher versions unless you build polyfills or something like that. You have to stay with that old version of the syntax. Um, okay, so how do they interrelate? Um, the goal usually is to maximize backward compatibility and minimize technical debt. Um, I think that should be pretty straightforward. Uh, I don't think that many people will, would question that, uh, that you want to maximize technical debt or, or break as much as possible. So I think this should be pretty straightforward to accept. The problem is that uh, backwards compatibility causes technical debt. It's one of the main major reasons why you have technical debt in the first place. So trying to maximize one while minimizing the other seems like a paradox. Uh, first of all, when you want to stay compatible, you cannot easily make changes, you make additions. So if um, let's go back to the example I said before, some library you're using, it changes the method signature of some method you're using and you want to stay compatible with the old version and also um, you properly use the new version without breaking. Then instead of changing your way of calling the method, which would make sense because the signature changed, uh, you, you cannot do that because you need to stay compatible with the two versions. So instead of changing your code, you actually add code. You add a conditional somewhere, you add the two ways of calling that method, and um, all of a sudden, that one change in the library caused uh, multiple ripple effects in your code, or at least caused you to add multiple lines with two different ways of calling the library. So if you want to stay backward compatible, most changes actually turn into additions and not changes. Then deletions, they turn into changes, actually. Because if you want to get rid of methods you provided in your interface to the users, but all of a sudden think that, um, that that was just silly to add that, let's remove it for the next version. Well, if you just remove it, then code will break because code expects this to still be there if it's supposed to be backward compatible. So instead of removing it, you actually deprecate it and probably even add logic to deal with that deprecation and let users know like printing a warning in the logs somewhere or something like that, so that the code will eventually be adapted. Um, so you cannot just remove pieces of your interface of your code uh, because that will create fatal errors in the consuming libraries. You will deprecate and still keep stuff around, which is really a pity because the reason you want to delete something is because it doesn't make sense and it incurs a maintenance cost and it has added technical debt and so on. But actually the way to get rid of it, this starts by adding more technical debt and adding more code to it. Um, so that's very problematic. Then finally, bugs 
actually turn into features. Um, that's something that a lot of um, developers often joke that, that a bug is a feature. But if you think about it, that's really what's happening. Um, if you have an old mature piece of software, it's almost guaranteed that it also contains bugs. The problem is that these bugs, they, they, can, they are what you consider the characterization of the code. Um, so if someone uses that uh, piece of code, they probably hit the box and then create workarounds. Or they're not aware, aware that something has, uh, is a bug, but they just know that this is the behavior of the code and I expect this behavior to stay the same. So if all of a sudden you fix a bug that changes the, uh, the, the behavior that the consuming code expects and the consuming code all of a sudden breaks because the library changed what it was doing for a given input. So for a given input, all of a sudden you get a different output. So fixing bugs uh, might actually not be possible in, in some scenarios, which, which leads us to the phrase, the bugs turn into features. So all of a sudden it's just, yeah, that's the way the software works and it will continue to work that way. We all know it's bug, but we cannot fix it without breaking all the rest. Um, so that's just stays. Um, what you can do though, as a first step to, to get more control over the technical debt and basically get back to the, so the goals we had, maximize backward compatibility and minimize technical debt. Uh, one way of making sure you can do that better is to also consider forward compatibility. So this, it sounds a bit strange, but forward compatibility is basically making sure that you stay compatible with future versions of your code. Uh, I know it sounds a bit, a bit silly, but basically what you want to do is um, assume that your code will need to change in the future, because as I said, the environment is constantly changing. There will be requirements changes. All of a sudden, um, the, um, I don't know, the browser landscape changes and the HTML you're producing is not correct anymore. So you need to change it. Um, that's something that is out of your control. You cannot control how the browsers evolve. But if you have code that generates HTML, all of a sudden that is a requirement change for your code and you need to adapt for it. You need to fix that. Uh, so change is unavoidable in any software project. You can in your change if it's a week long project. You cannot in your change if it's a project of any meaningful time frame, because it will happen. And then you need to plan and build your code in such a way that you have uh, at least a vague idea of how that code would need to evolve in the future, of how it would need to adapt to future requirements changes, and build it in such a way that you can adapt to future requirement changes without creating new technical debt or creating breaking changes. This is harder done than said. I don't think that's a saying. Um, easier said than done, that's the way around. Um, and um, it is not possible to predict the future right now. So uh, that, that leaves us with the next best thing. We can learn from the past and try to build our code in such a way that it would not introduce these problems with, um, with evolutions we already witnessed in the past. So what that means is know about best practices. Best practices are basically all the problems that developers have hit in the past where they try to encode this in such a way that you can learn from that without making the same mistake again. So instead of uh, only learning from your own mistakes, you can actually learn from other people's mistakes and you can learn from mistakes in the past instead of making mistakes in the present and learning from them in the future. Um, so these best practices, they help you actually consider what should be good extensibility points for your software. How should you build something that's flexible enough to adapt easily uh, in the future. Um, this all comes down to um, 
loosely coupled code and interfaces in the right places and so on and so forth. So all, uh, all of this takes both best practices and experience to do it properly. Can be done, but it's, it's difficult uh, if, if you lack experience. All you can do is really um, try to learn as much as possible from best practices because they encode the experience of other people for you so that you can make use of them. But usually it's very tough to take best practices and apply them to your specific code if you lack the experience of, of a few years of already having tried that. Um, but that's basically what you want to do. Uh, so have forward compatibility as one uh, big uh, goal because that's, that makes it so that you can avoid a lot of technical debt and result in breaking changes. And um, if you have breaking changes in place, um, if, if you have technical debt in place, there's another tool you can use, uh, semantic versioning. It basically encodes the way you deal with uh, breaking changes. Uh, so there's ma major version bumps, there's minor version bumps and patch version bumps. And whenever you need to create major versions, uh, whenever you need to create breaking changes, you basically bump the major version. And what this actually then does is, if, if you look at the surface at the bottom, that is basically the technical depth that you've accumulated. And semantic versioning lets you encode the breaking changes so that you do them in a controlled way. Uh, so you're not constantly doing them. You stay backward compatible within a major version as much as possible. Um, but then uh, when, whenever there's an issue, you can bump the major version and make control breaking change and drastically reduce the technical depth again. And um, now I want to briefly discuss what, the, what this means for WordPress. Um, so first of all, this is, this is a screenshot from Code Climate, a static analysis tool, um, which um, shows us that um, WordPress has accumulated 15 years of technical debt according to uh, Code Climate. So this screenshot was actually not taken recently, but it was taken uh, during the, the 15th anniversary of WordPress, which basically uh, tried to uh, let us know that all WordPress did was accumulate technical debt. Um, of course, that's simplification because this is, this is man hours for, for one person doing this, um, but it's um, quite impressive to see how much technical debt a project can accumulate when it prefers backward compatibility over breaking changes because WordPress uh, does not use semantic versioning. So WordPress does not often define a strict API, which is a problem because there is no explicit interface. So with WordPress, um, um, it, it seldom defines a proper interface to code just grows. And when you have no explicit interface, it basically means that uh, all of your code becomes the implicit interface. Um, and this would in turn mean that any change to the code uh, is a breaking change because any change of the code covers the implicit interface. Um, WordPress also has constantly growing uh, requirements. Um, the, um, the backwards compatibility um, is, as I said, the topmost priority. And one of the, the uh, core leads uh, once said to me that uh, WordPress is basically technical debt as a service. They take on the technical debt so that the consumers don't have to use and uh, have to do that. And there's a lot happening behind the scenes to, to make that happen, but that all creates technical debt. Um, at one point, it became so bad that the compatibility code within WordPress to keep backward compatibility became incompatible with itself. Um, so um, that makes it more and more dramatic to actually keep everything running. Uh, here, for example, you see, uh, um, uh, you see um, what happened to the autoloader. Uh, so WordPress had an autoloader um, compatibility piece to, um, to cover WordPress 5.2 because um, the uh, SPL autoload 
um, could be disabled for WordPress 5.2. And um, then with, um, with PHP 7.2, the old autoload function, which was used for the compatibility shim, um, became deprecated. So all of a sudden, the compati compatibility code was not compatible anymore with newer versions of PHP. So that's the type of problems you run into if you cover too big a range and if you have too much technical depth. And if that goes on and on and on, technical debt eventually leads to technical bankruptcy. Technical bankruptcy uh, means that um, there are requirement changes that you need to react to, but you're unable to do so in a satisfying manner because it's either too costly or takes too long or is just not possible without breaking anything, uh, everything. Um, so that's real danger if your technical debt becomes too high. And that's um, how a lot of software projects actually die. They cannot adapt fast enough anymore to evolutions in requirements. So at one point, they just, um, they, they just fizzle out. Um, I personally um, con contributed to getting WordPress to bump its uh, PHP minimum version. I wanted to quickly talk about how we did this uh, as an example of um, how you might balance this act of these two opposing forces. Uh, so first of all, for, um, for WordPress, um, although um, you shouldn't ever have uh, the reckless pause of a technical debt, that's happening all the time with WordPress, but that could be avoided. Uh, the first one, the reckless deliberate, can be avoided by planning ahead. The reckless inadvertent one can be avoided by educating. Uh, educating is easy on one one in a one to one, but it's actually pretty hard at the scale of WordPress. Uh, so that constantly lets us accumulate more technical debt. But then we have the other part where, when you have prudent, deliberate technical debt, it would just mean that you factor in the next iteration and plan ahead to get rid of the technical debt again through semantic versioning. So that's from an engineering standpoint how you would want to do that. But WordPress does not have semantic versioning. It is just supposed to stay compatible forever and ever. At least that's the philosophy behind the project. So how do we do that then? First of all, we cannot just drop support. That's a breaking change. So usually you would drop support for the set of versions you want to get rid of, and then users would have to adapt. Um, but you basically leave behind the users that cannot adapt um, to... Um, to that um, new change. So you have users that have old code that is too costly to refactor, for example, they will just be left out in the cold. So with WordPress, uh, what we've done instead is we built lots and lots of tools and incentives to actually change the usage first um, and get the amount of people using the ports we want to get rid of as low as possible so that at one point it is basically um, it is technically a breaking change, but practically it's just we remove unused code. Um, so we didn't get to 0%, but it was a pretty small percentage that was left at the end. And we actually managed to bump from PHP 5.2 to PHP 5.6 in one go already without leaving uh, people behind. Um, that's... Um, um, just let me briefly state, so that was done uh, by uh, giving the users a notice that they should talk to their hosts to adapt their PHP versions uh, by adding lots of features to incentivize the plugins and the themes to update because they would, uh, uh, they would lose advantages if they're not doing so, and by adding... Um, extra protection in the code so that when you actually update your PHP version, that anything that's still not compatible doesn't take the entire site down, but just gets deactivated and lets the user act on it. So that's, that's how we achieve that. So the key takeaways, technical debt should be avoided. Technical debt needs to re be repaid if you could not avoid it, because it will get worse and worse with time. And backward compatibility should be maintained. Uh, to not make your code a moving target. But um, unfortunately, 
backward compatibility creates technical debt. So those are the two opposing forces that you need to balance out in the end. Uh, only breaking changes can substantially reduce technical debt, and those breaking changes are bad as well. So what does that leave, leave us with? In the end, it just means that um, use forward compatibility to uh, avoid technical debt and therefore indirectly avoid breaking changes. And that can be summed up to think before you code. Um, if you start a new project, um, just um, it's, it's basically very simple. Have the time component as one of the requirements. Know how long your project should live and know how you should build your project so that it covers the entire time spectrum instead of only the state at the beginning that you want to build. So keep the time component in mind when planning your software. Um, yes, yeah, so that's, that's it for my talk. Uh, I'm happy to uh, answer questions now. Let's see whether we have questions. I'm, yes, I'll thanks, Alan, for your interesting screen. insights. Um, as far as I can see, there are no questions popping up at the moment, uh, which means that the speaker explained everything perfectly. Wonderful. <laughs> um, if there are any questions left for now, uh, Alan will be around in the chat for a while, so please feel free to contact him there. And now we just imagine your applause that would be coming up if we would be at a physical conference. So many thanks again for your talk. Uh, many thanks for staying with us. And all our attendees, please keep in mind that you can uh, give us some feedback on Swapcard on the session. And I hope you have a lovely day at the conference. Bye-bye.